Um, now that we all have broadsides in our hands, I think we're ready to go. Okay, first, uh, if you were here last month, you may recall that uh, I had hoped that I would do uh, what I'm doing tonight uh, last month, but uh, the issue was in the printer that day, and well, it was. It finally arrived the following day. So uh, now we can do this. Uh, last uh, month's uh, glad night, uh, of course, that's at uh, the YouTube uh, Flint Underground channel, uh, and uh, between last month and this month, uh, of course, uh, it's also on the Monday at six, uh, the Creative Line Show on Comcast Channel 17. Uh, six every Monday night at 6 uh, and uh, I record that show to see what's on uh, but Comcast threw me a, a loop uh, because uh, they turned off their analog signal so that meant uh, I had to get their digital converter box which I hooked up to the computer so I can record the show again uh, I recorded the, the last one uh, which uh, of course it was last Monday and they had last month's uh, collab night so I edited down that segment, uh, with, so it's just me, uh, and I uploaded it, so it's now on YouTube, and there's a link to it on my Remembering Flint, Michigan Facebook page. So, uh, so uh, you can uh, look for that. Now for my uh, broadside piece, uh, turn your broadside to page five for the well, I wanted to write for a long time and finally got published. And uh, before I got here, uh, there's a, an outfit, I'll uh, mention it later on, but uh, I mailed the tear sheet of that article to that couple maker in Ohio. Well, I hope they like it. So here's the piece called Gary and the Technicolor Dream Capote. <laughs> Thank you. Recalling when you were taught early American history, you may have learned about a British trading company called the Hudson's Bay Company, which was founded on May 2nd, 1670, as the governor and company of adventurers in England trading into Hudson's Bay. Michigan's coat of arms was inspired by the coat of arms of the Hudson's Bay Company, and I'll use its initials HBC uh, to save time. The Hudson's Bay Company traded with the native peoples in North America in present-day Canada and the northern United States. The trade was usually with beaver pelts, which were traded for good, such goods as axes, ironware, copperware, knives, firearms, and wool blankets. Among the wool blankets uh, the Hudson's Bay Company traded with the natives of North America was a point blanket made in England. The point blankets were available in different sizes determined by the number of short lines or points on each blanket. Records state that the four-point blankets were standard issue for American militiamen during the Revolutionary War. Besides obvious use as sleeping blankets to keep warm during the cold winter months, point blankets were also made into clothing, whether they were worn like robe or togas or sewn into coats. French fur traders made wool blankets into long hooded coats called capotes which the native peoples also adopted. Local Chippewa chief Naomi and his friend Flint founder Jacob Smith, who came to this area from Quebec, could have worn capotes. During the War of 1812, British soldiers on Mackinac Island used the supply point blankets and made them into short coats, which are still called Mackinaws. Unless you frequently shop in Canada, you may be surprised that the Hudson's Bay Company still exists as North America's oldest retailer. The flagship department stores are now known simply as Hudson's Bay. The Hudson's Bay Company also owns the American department store chain, Boyd & Taylor. You may also be surprised that the Hudson's Bay Point Blanket, sold beginning around 1780, are still available at Hudson's Bay stores throughout Canada and are still made in England. The Hudson's Bay Point Blanket is also available in the United States through Woolbridge which has the exclusive license to import Hudson's Bay Point Blankets into the United States. While shopping at the Outlet Mall in Birch Run in 2008, I looked up the list of tenants and was surprised to see that Woolwich operated an outlet store 
at what is now Birch Run Cream in Montlitz. When I first stopped there, I asked where their blankets were and was directed to the back of the store where they offered different varieties of blankets, including Army blankets from the Civil War era and New Hudson's Bay four-point blankets for full-size beds, six-point blankets for queen-size beds, and eight-point blankets for king-size beds. They are available in different styles, but the most popular is a classic white blanket with four different color stripes, green, red, yellow, and indigo. They also offer pillow shams and a smaller throw blanket. At that time, I could only afford the throw, which is now on my living room sofa. But after saving enough money, I got the classic multicolor four-point blanket. The Woolwich Outlet Store in Birch Run, the last time I was there before it closed last January, offered a four-point blanket for $296. Obviously, the larger six and eight point blankets are much more expensive. Just before Thanksgiving of 2009, I took part in an interfaith service at the Baha'i School in Davidson. With the Native Americans in attendance, the service evolved into a powwow. This had me thinking that I should have worn my husband's bay point, four point blanket like a robe. But I realized that the thick four point blanket was too bulky and large to wear it like that. So I thought about a blanket coat such as the coats worn 200 years ago. While the Hudson's Bay Company made coats using point blanket material, they stopped making them in recent years. Fortunately, I found a place on the internet called Northwest Traders in Eden, Ohio, which offers authentic looking capotes, capote kits, and blankets for reenactments. They make capotes from the blankets they sell or from what customers provide. As I held out for authenticity and for budgetary reasons, I began to scour eBay listings for Hudson's Bay four point blankets. I should point out that beginning in 1890, the Hudson's Bay Company's point blanket makers in England began adding labels because point blankets of similar quality were being sold by HBC competitors such as Earlies of Whitney, which is now defunct, which formerly made point blankets for HBC. Learning from a book published by HBC titled The Blanket by Harold Teichenor, which was available at the now closed Woolwich Outlet store, I learned that the Hudson's Bay Point Blanket label evolved over the years. The first successful bid I made for a Hudson's Bay Point Blanket proved to be of a rare vintage from the 1930s, which has a longer nap compared to Point Blankets sold today. The book mentioned that the 1950s label design with a 100% wool designation was most common of older blankets, so I spent several months trying to fit on a Hudson's Bay Point Blanket of, of that vintage. I finally made a successful and affordable bid around March 2010. The blanket's green stripes were slightly faded, which gave it a satisfactory patina. But someone had so sewn satin trim on the blanket, which was clearly not original. So before sending the blanket to the dry cleaner, I removed the trim, leaving the impressions where the stitching had been. After following Northwest Trader's instructions for making capote measurements, I ordered the Northwestern style with a hood and short cape. After I sent the blanket, I was informed that along the way, someone laundered the wool blanket, making it shrink further. In the manufacturing process, point blankets are pre-shrunk to make them more dense. The finished capote arrived in early April 2010 to my complete satisfaction. As it is a one-of-a-kind coat in the Flint area, I have made it the desired coat to wear when going out during the winter months and when promoting my book Remembering Flint, Michigan. I like to give my capote homecomings of sorts when I travel to Sarnia, Ontario. When in my capote, I was surprised how many nice people I meet there. The point blanket and capote are iconic to a Canadian history, and I was encouraged to take part in the War of 1812 reenactments to know this bicentennial. Among those that mind my, my capote are First Nations members. Sarnia is home to be to the Amijawang First Nation Reserve. In the Flint area, people admire how warm the coat looks, which it is. The only criticism I received was about the hood's design, so I prefer to de-emphasize the point on the hood to avoid looking too much like a Klansman. <laughs> now, the illustration, on this, even though this is, isn't black and white on, on this paper, it is in color, and uh, I've uh, uploaded the color image uh, on my uh, Remembering Flint, Michigan Facebook page, and I also emailed that image, I hope. Uh, yeah, 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 you got it, okay. And uh, the piece I'm working on now, which may appear in the next broadside, is about the history of uh, Burson Hill Fieldhouse. I think I'll call the piece Incubator of Champions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>